guys. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Great. It's a small group here, so very um, informal, formal. So thank you all for coming. Um, you're in. I want to open. Uh, dot dot dot. Are you in the right session? <laughs> in this session, uh, we'll be exploring um, the idea of opening a direct consumer space. Uh, what you need to know to get started, what resources are available, how you can get started. Our speakers will share insights, resources, and stories from their experiences starting or running a retail space. Uh, we'll also explore challenges and lessons that they've learned along the way. Um, our speakers here, we've got Colin Page. Colin is a painter and a gallery owner living in Camden, Maine. Um, whether working on location or in the studio, he strives to capture atmosphere of light and uh, atmosphere and light in a scene. Colin focuses on painting and landscape and scenes that show his life as a father of two young girls. Um, in May of 2019, Colin opened the Page Gallery in Camden, which I, admit I have not visited yet, so this is a good, good reminder. The gallery exhibits a wide variety of paintings, um, drawings, sculptures. Um, by leading contemporary artists. We also have Mer uh, Emmy Anderson. Emmy uh, is the network coordinator for the Cooperative Bain Business Alliance. Uh, she has an MBA with a focus on sustainable business practices and has many years of retail management experience, most recently as the general manager for a local food co-op. Uh, Emmy has served on the Western Maine Arts Art Group's Board of Directors in the past and is currently serving as the director of the Androscoggin Land Trust Board. A director. A director. <laughs> on the Board of Directors. On the Board of Directors. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying. And then Marion Baker over here, whose studio I have been to, um, is a potter, uh, pottery artist out of Yarmouth. And has maintained a summer studio and gallery on Little Cranberry Island, uh, AKA as we call it, Island Institute, Islesford. Um, and if you haven't been there, you should go. Um, and she's had that since 1989, is that right? Marion's focus is on pots for daily use or a celebration, and she's inspired on it by um, traditions of English and Japanese pottery, adding design and color from nature and her surroundings. She believes handmade pottery is like a bridge between art and daily life. So with that, I'm going to get started. These three are going to be giving you um, everything you need to know. Uh, but we're going to hold off on questions until after they're all finished. Um, but if you need to step out, please feel free to do that. Um, we have till um, 12.15 and lunch is at 12.30. So um, we have a lot of cushion here to work with. Um, these are the ones in the hot seat. So. Uh, with that, Colin will go first, and then we'll have Baron, and then we'll have Emmy. Okay. Hi, everybody. We want to see the slides. Oh, yeah. And so I just went with Yeah. I like having more of the audience. That's fine. Um, all right, so uh, to introduce myself, I'm Colin Page. Um, I grew up in Baltimore, and my sort of history in getting into becoming an artist and a gallery owner is um, growing up in Baltimore, I went to high school for the arts there, where we had half the day art, half the day academics, so there was a lot of studio training there. And then I went to college at Rhode Island School of Design for two years and transferred to Cooper Union in New York, where I graduated in 2000. Um, and then in 2002, after working a bunch of odd jobs and trying to scrape by, I moved to Maine and left my apartment in Brooklyn, which was like half the size of this room with three other guys staying in it. So it was like, I just wanted a little more room and um, kind of came here on a whim and was so happy to see how many artistic people lived up here. So that's how I got to Maine and became really um, kind of like a Maine artist. Like I feel very attached to this state now. Uh, so, I, when I moved here, I showed in several different galleries. I was doing a lot of outdoor art shows and um, doing everything I could to get my work out in the world. Um, and after 10 years at Dowling Walsh Gallery, I was trying to figure out how to take sort of the next step in my career and figure out where, how to kind of go somewhere, go forward with my career. 
even though Dowling Walsh was like the best gallery in the state that I was that I'd seen. So um, I was trying to think creatively about how to do that, and uh, I was having meetings with my friend Kirsten Serby, who um, had worked at Dowling Walsh previously, and she we were sort of talking about ways to um, progress my career, and we decided to open a gallery together. So that was in May of 2019. We opened the gallery. Um, and there are now three of us there. But in the beginning, it was Kirsten and I primarily. And uh, one of the reasons that we thought we could open a gallery was that we knew we got along well. We worked we worked together through me showing at Dowling Walsh and her working there, and um, we you know we so we had familiarity with kind of our generally that our personalities would work well together. We had similar tastes in art, um, similar ethic about what kind of um, what the gallery should look like. And a good division of labor and skills. Like she knows how to use QuickBooks, and I have no idea. <laughs> so there's like there are a lot of there. It, we've turned out to have um, our skills line up very well, so we can cover all aspects of keeping the gallery moving. Um, and uh, in the beginning, when when we were opening the gallery, one of the things we really wanted to do was um, to have. Uh, a couple of different um, aspects of the gallery. We wanted to make sure it was, you know, obviously a profitable business of uh, showing the highest level of art that we could get or get to come in, um, and uh, we wanted to have sort of like a museum model where, you know, like all galleries, like anyone's welcome to come in any time. But a lot of times people don't feel welcome to come in up the street. Um, we're conveniently located next to an ice cream shop, so we have a lot of kids and families just on our block all the time. And it's really nice to have these kids coming in, and they see, you know, there's usually paintings of, or, and photographs and sculptures that are, you know, there's a wide range of detailed things, um, very expressionistic things, abstract sculptures. Uh, so there's always there's always things to engage with people. Um, and we want to be a, like a really welcoming, family-friendly place, and we also want to do a lot of community involvement um, and try to find ways to um, sort of. Since, not, since we weren't a nonprofit, things we could do to support nonprofits or support our neighborhood. Um, and so the, we felt like we could open the gallery, um, partly because uh, going through, sort of, we went through the numbers and I had shown in several galleries where I'd become friendly with those gallery owners and managers, and so I would call them. And basically, one, in, one of my friends in Charleston who managed the gallery gave me her, she just broke down her monthly cost for me. I called and said, I'm thinking of doing this, I don't know how stupid it is. So I, I can guess some of the costs, but like, what am I not thinking of? And it turned out ensuring art was one that didn't occur to me. So like, and then it wasn't too bad, but we, she broke down what are the monthly costs of this. Um, and the startup costs weren't too bad. Um, Kirsten and I had a lot of connections with other artists, and so um, it was easy to reach out to people. In the beginning, we were trying to figure out, is this going to be just my art, or are there going to be a lot of other artists there? So we made a list of our some of our favorite artists and just started calling people. And the first five people we called all said yes. We thought, holy shit, I think we're doing this. Like, <laughs> this is, I think we're gonna have, we're, this is going to be like a bigger thing than the original idea. Um, and then it was also helpful having the connections with the collectors, um, both from her working in a gallery and me having shown in Maine for a long time. It felt like we had the, the sort of foundational building blocks to make this successful. So. Um, one, one of the things uh, that we were asked to talk about is like our challenges um, and changes, things we would do differently. Um, and the, the biggest thing I think we would have done differently is in the first couple years, the first two summers, um, Kirsten and I were trying to do the majority of the work and we would have um, like college kids coming and filling in on weekends and times when we couldn't be there. So. Um, since then, we've had we have our friend Lisa now working with us, and it was really helpful to have these young people involved in helping cover some of the hours. But I think it would have been more helpful to think of them more as in, think of the college kids more as interns to come in and help out um, with projects once we were set up, and to, in the and to have invested more in hiring Lisa, who's now she she's. The, all three of us are parents of young children, and um, we'll have complicated schedules to make it work. But the three of us also have full life experiences that we can bring. So when collectors come in, it's very easy 
for us all to meet them in a, a warm, welcoming way and have easy conversations with them. Um, and we are all trying to, we're all contributing to the gallery in major ways. So I think the main thing we would have done differently from the first summer is find another, uh, uh, find, find, invest more in the other people who are going to work there with us. Um, and then the other challenge which we were just talking about was we opened the gallery in 2019 in May. And so a year later, we were forcibly closed for three months for COVID. And we had a great first year, and we were really excited coming the second year, and then having to shut the gallery down, I was terrified. Kirsten was fine. She, <laughs> she seemed to think everything was gonna work out fine. But um, that's because she has skills like knowing how to use QuickBooks, and I don't. And so all I know how to do <laughs> is paint and try to, and try to share that art with people. Um, so we were very creative for those three months when we were closed for COVID. Um, we did the, it was sort of leading into the summer season anyway, so it was, it was not the busiest time of year for us, but we, this was one of our windows during COVID. Um, we had, at the time, just this, these two storefront windows that we had been fairly conservative with. It was always nice white walls with one big painting in each window, and um, we realized this was the entire gallery, because no one could come inside. So we started painting in bright colors and coming up with thematic exhibitions for the windows. So this was our return to spring window. Um, we had a magic and mystery window. Um, and I don't remember, we had, it was every two weeks for a couple months. We were changing out the window, I'd repaint the wall, and we, we you know, we figured it's like Saks Fifth Avenue. We have to mess <laughs> these things up a little bit. Um, so that was, that, but it turned out, it, once we opened up, it turned out everything was fine and it really, like, things picked up very nicely that summer. But it was a real scramble to try to figure out how many different ways, other than just using the storefront, can we reach out to collectors and clients and artists and friends and get them to, and engage with them in productive ways. Um, so the thing that's been the most fun part of the gallery that I was not expecting is doing silly things like this. This was, um, we have, there's a Christmas by the Sea parade in Camden every year in December, and it, it turns out anyone can put a float in, and the float can be whatever you want it to be. So they can be a beat up old blue Subaru with a reindeer, reindeer from a front yard strapped to the roof. So um, we, we've done, being in town, it's been fun realizing how much of a part of the neighborhood we are, and so, we try to engage with as many of these community events as possible. So things like the Christmas by the Sea Parade, um, it's, a, it's a very easy thing to step up and join. Um, and then we also, like this past year, we had a whole craft, because there's the Christmas by the Sea Parade at 6 p.m. on a cold December night, and there are all these kids there to go see it, and there's, you know, there's not a lot you can do in town if you have like a four-year-old. So we had a craft station set up in the warm gallery so kids could come do that, have hot cocoa, and then go watch the parade. So I mean, there are little things like that we try to do to give back. Um, and then we've also been spearheading a Camden Art Walk that is, we're working with several of the other galleries in town. Um, and we now shut down Bayview Street from Route 1 down to just past our gallery, where there are a couple of galleries for the Camden Art Walk in that little section, Route 1. Um, and during that time, there's you can see the musicians here. We've got live music at every one of the art walks now, and um, we usually try to have a food truck in. And uh, there's sidewalk chalk that we have. That box is bigger than it looks. This the immense amount of sidewalk chalk we bring out every art walk, and so the kids just cover the streets. Um, and the Camden Library, the Children's Librarian, comes and sets up a craft project. Um, so we try to have a, a lot of like family-friendly activities around the art walk to try to um, make everyone again feel welcome and that kind of like make art less intimidating so everyone feels like they can come enjoy it. Um, and the uh, we also have a we host shows sometimes um, like this is for a figure drawing group. Um, we there's Camden, Rockland, Friendship, and Belfast Waterfall Arts all had um, this past Fe or March, I think. Um, we have a figure drawing show where the, these figure drawing groups meet weekly, all year round, and people don't really see what they do or know what they're doing, and they didn't necessarily want to have a show where they were framing everything and trying to sell it, but they wanted to just 
share with the community. This is something we do that we're passionate about. So we gave up a big chunk of the gallery and just pinned up work up. You can see in the background, we pinned work all over the walls, sort of like a studio critique, so it feels like a figure drawing classroom. Mm -hmm. And then um, for, we did this last year and the year before, um, and we would have them come in and have clothed models because we are open and, like I said, family friendly. Um, <laughs> so we have clothed models pose and it's usually people in the group taking turns modeling while everyone else is drawing. And then we have extra art supplies and easels set up. So it, they, the first year we did it, there were some teenagers walked by and they're just trying to figure out, what are you guys doing in here? Because <laughs> it was definitely not the norm. And they ended up sitting down and drawing for a half hour and just they, you know, picking up whatever supplies were around. So it's, we really like this sort of like bringing, in, bringing the neighborhood in. Um, we also do a, uh, the, there's a local classical music school, Bay Chamber in Rockport, and they have their, um, their traditional recitals every year, and th for the spring semester and fall semester, they do recitals. And those are, you know, everybody sits down in chairs and watches, and it's very formal. And we offer the space, because we've recently expanded into, we've doubled our size uh, this past October. So now this second space is more wide open, and we've been trying to bring in um, bring in different uses of that to um, to like take advantage of the the bigger room. So these the Bay Chamber recitals, we've had um, those string instruments in January, and with three Saturdays in a row, the kids who are practicing for the recitals anyway would come in and do like a very casual performance for their family and friends. And people coming in and out of the gallery and just hearing classical music being played by these kids. And then um, since then we've partnered with Bay Chamber and we have a piano in the gallery. So we're going to be having piano recitals in May, I think three Saturdays in a row in May, um, where the children who are getting ready for their spring recital anyway will come in and perform for us. Um, and then this we're also opening up with this new space we have. This is the newer room. You can see the corner of the piano just in there. Um, we are doing some more workshops and classes to try to um, give both our artists chances to share information and also um, bringing people in to use the space in different ways. Um, so this is Anneli Scars teaching a paper flower workshop. We have Michael Stasiak is going to be teaching a puppet mask making workshop. Um, I've taught some workshops previously on oil painting, and uh, we're going to have some talks, like some of our artists are going to be doing talks along with their shows, so Anneli will also be doing a talk next week, I think. Um, and then we have Jessica Ives will be doing a talk this summer. So using the space for more community involvement there. Um, and then the most fun thing we do is every February, um, we, like I said, the three of us who work there all have children, and they all want their work on the walls. And so my kids were really pushy when we were opening the gallery, and I said, no, you can't do that, but I'll give you one month where you can put a few things up. And it turned out that was really complicated to figure out, because you can't just have, if it's just my kids, they want to invite their friends, but then how do you invite their friends, but then someone else doesn't feel invited? So we decided, Anyone who wants to make a piece of art who is a child is allowed to make it. So you guys are not allowed to. But <laughs> your children are more than welcome. And, you, and we hand out we hand out supplies like these panels. We gave several hundred of those to the local schools. And um, we've done postcards. That There's a mural project on the right up there that is, I think it was 18 different panels that we had these high school kids take where we let an image up into 18 little pieces and they painted them all separately and we assembled them on the wall to make a mural. Um, we try to have craft projects on site so that this year we had, um, we had lots of kids coming in after school. Like this is my daughter Audrey, I think the previous year. We have wheels of a loom as part of the kids project with a bunch of strips of fabric and they come in and they work with the loom. They do uh, painting on site. We staple a few, big piece of canvas, almost the size of the screen, to the wall, and just have a bunch of paint sitting out. We've turned. We've realized they have to be washable paints now. <laughs> I, I kept pushing for acrylic, and then yeah. enough people's clothes got ruined that I was vetoed on that. <laughs> um, but uh, it's really fun seeing these kids just get in there, and that sometimes 
you know, kids come in a lot, and we, have, we were able to engage with them about the art in short conversations. But with this show, they'll be in there for 45 minutes, just an hour, just playing. We, we're making, you can see some of the little paper bag puppets that were made up there, and then we had sock, oh, she's got a sock puppet right here. And kids would come in and make the things they could play with in the gallery. And then this was this year's mural. Um, but one of the benefits of the kids' show is we're also teaching kids about artists. So these guys are making, uh, small pieces to a bigger doll and car image that is from one of the children's books that they were familiar with. Um, so it's fun to get to not just give them an opportunity to make things, but also to um, to educate them about some main artists. And then, uh, yeah, so I think the, the main thing that I've learned from opening the gallery, I thought the I thought it was mostly going to be about just trying to figure out how to monetize artwork and make profit, but it's been really, it's been rewarding to realize um, just how much of a, we're part of the neighborhood and part of the community in Camden, and find and that there are so many ways we can give back, and it's not just in terms of you can actually monetize that too because the giving back is also the best advertising we do. So like we pay for ads in magazines, we. Hey, we have an ad in Mariners, the restaurant in Camden. There's a little ad on their placemat menu. You know, we do these like fun ways to advertise. But really, like having an art walk, having the kids show, having these like the kids show is the most work of any show we do all year, and nothing's for sale. We make zero dollars from a sale of kids work that we work towards getting together. But it's really fun for us, and it's the whole community is grateful for it. So it actually works all the way around. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Just your seat. Nice. So, like, I um, love that community involvement. That's fantastic. You know, like, I have been in some art galleries before and felt intimidated. And now I can see how you can, that cannot be by those things. So, thank you. Um, I'm Marion Baker. Let me just get started. Whoops. Wrong direction. Um, just briefly, um, just keep it done. So I taught at Maine College of Art in Portland for 35 years. But early in my teaching career, when I was in my early 30s, I met someone who soared on an island called Little Pembroke Island, or Islesburg. Some of you have been there. And um, I was working hard at Mecca in my, my studio times this summer. So I told my husband, I'll go up there. He had a summer place there. He grew up there, had that summer place. He said, let's go to the island. I'm like, I'll go for one week, no more than that, because this is my studio time in the summer, and I have a studio in Portland. He goes, well, what if we could have, you could have a studio there and a store? And I'm like, well, let's, let's, let's think about that. Let's, think, let's talk about that. And this was 1988. And this was, this was one of the three docks in Islesburg. By the way, if you haven't, if you know anything about it, it's an island, not an island with a bridge. It is an island with a boat to get there and no car ferry. Only, um, you know, you can hire a barge for a vehicle, but you can't just drive to it without a lot of work. So keep that in mind. So here's the dock that we, we there's a restaurant at the end of the dock. There were a lot of empty spaces that were full of garbage and full of trash that had been previously used by lobstermen. To, to you know, fix their traps or boats, you know, many uses over the years. So one of the messiest places, we talked to the owner of the dock and said, can I have this space and next summer have a little studio and a store? And we talked a little further about it. And um, that particular owner has changed ownership a few times, but that owner said, you can do it if you do everything. We had, we had to put a door in a window in that wasn't there. This was there, but there's, we had to put that in. So we did it with found things. My husband, luckily, is a, was a builder and then eventually an architect. And so we, we built it. He said, you can have the first summer with no rent, which was awesome, but you had to do everything. Like, and then we had to clean it out. It was 18 feet bags of garbage, old crap. And we built a store, built a wall, and um, used, okay. I'm gonna keep going. So then you can see, uh, I'm gonna be looking both ways here. So in the end, that's my first little spot there is the, is the shop. Not too bad, 
Yeah, right? Who wouldn't do that? So, but it's just seasonal. So it's just June, July, and August, half of September. And the inside is both a studio and a store. So this is a little unique, but if anyone can do that, it, you're not just sitting there waiting for people to come in and have sales. You're actually getting work done when it isn't busy. And as things got busier, I ended up deciding, oh, well, let me just explain this a little bit. So there's, you can see the studio space is in the back, but it's set up so the front is clearly the store part. Oh, this is going to zip around. So if you're standing there, you're turning around, looking at, there's some nice work there right here. <laughs> right, Caitlin? <laughs> Sweet. So I am now selling, this is just looking around in a circle. Oops. And then that's, and then um, I wanted to say this so don't forget, and the bottom of this section are things that are sold as seconds. They're either old, we don't like them, or there's a, some slight flaw. And I, who doesn't like, like something used or old? Like, so I love that we can sell seconds because some people can buy things that they may not be able to afford and we get a little bit of money back for something that, you know, but a lot of galleries don't do that, which I get, but I'm happy to. And a lot of people are happy for these flawed pieces. Uh, anyway, so this is from the back door looking in. So there's a back door that we can come in and you can see how the front is set up as the, the clear store. And then the back part is studio on the left on the left there is my kiln covered with a sheet because this is before I started to um, open up for the season. There's the kiln. So this is behind the store part. The glazes, the bench, the bench and the vise. That was when it was a lobsterman shop. I didn't put that in, you know, but it's a nice solid bench. And where the kiln is, it's up on bricks and cinder blocks and that used to be a wood stove actually when it was a different use. Okay, this is, oh yeah, right, this is the neat right before we start working and this is working. So you can see there's a couple of, there's wheels on the very far left. There's two wheels. I'm in the back corner. We stand when we throw. Is that Caitlin? That's me. So Caitlin, if you don't know Caitlin, is one of, was a co-potter there for many years. So you correct me if I say something wrong. That's okay. <laughs> or forget something important. Um, but so that's just how it looks working. And behind the back door, there's lobster traps in the co-op dock. So you can dry your pots out there. It's really mm -hmm. nice, really convenient. This is just a close-up. This is showing many different people's work. So, in I opened in '89. I was I didn't have any kids. In 1991, I was except we had a kid in '92. I thought I can't run the shop every day. I'm going to get a co-potter. This was the, the first couple of years was just me, and like limited hours. So I started in '93. Actually, I began to have a co-potter, and I was teaching at Mecca then, so I had a, access to former students who would graduate and. I said, hey, come and work for a summer, learn about business, make pots, sell them, and find a lot of information out about for them about how to run a business, or one way, just one way to run a business. So um, I began to do that and rotate them about every two years um, so I could provide the opportunity for new people and change the work up. We shared the hours so I could have be with my kids sometimes, but also be in the shop. And by the way, we taught, we taught, well, I'm gonna talk about that later. This is the front, this is the show, looking out from my, my door out. And I made this whirly gig in a workshop, it's a potter, it's a self-portrait. <laughs> anyway, um, so this is like, just like, duh, can I have an okay view or? Okay view? <laughs> yeah, I can handle it. You know, That's horrible, this. Marianne. <laughs> I am like, lucky, as me and my husband. Oh, so this reminds me, we don't have a computer there. We don't have the internet. This is what I do. I write it up on a receipt and I have a telephone landline that this credit cards run through. And I take checks, cash, and credit cards galore, galore. Credit cards especially, but I don't really need the internet there because, I mean, so if you can get it on your phone, you can, but there's, I pay for the internet at, the, at our house on the island, which is too far away for an extender. So I don't want to pay twice. You don't need it. It's more secure. Do you know that it's more secure? Nobody can hack anything, <laughs> right? I mean, it's great. Okay, this is off season. So this is just showing when I close up in, in August or in mid-September, there's going to be damage. So I have to put everything up off the floor. The mats are up. Everything's up. Everything's up because this happens. Mm -hmm. So there are storms and the ocean comes in in the winter and shoots the boards up. It hits a cement bulkhead that's up against that end of the dock and the boards and there's seaweed and rocks come in. 
things, one time that sales desk was actually fallen over on its side. So, uh, glory be. So my husband luckily goes in and sledgehammers the wood down and puts in more spikes every year and then we clean out the seaweed. This is all gonna happen next week. <laughs> Wednesday, I'm gonna be there. Uh, actually, he already did the boards. We're gonna be cleaning it up and putting down the mats. But, so this is maintenance. So when, when we, she asked about challenges. Let me bring my notes. When she asked about challenges, this way I'll remember what to tell you. This is one of them. Is the, one of the challenges is getting things out to an island that are heavy. And I think, why wasn't I a jeweler? <laughs> but no, I love the pottery. But, so I have to schlep out boxes of clay and boxes of pots and get it out there. And then it all goes away. It's fabulous, like in different places. Anyway, so this happens. Um, oh yeah, this is great. So we taught kids clay classes um, for 15 years. And that gave an opportunity for, um, isn't that great, Caitlin? Oh. So that's Caitlin. That's me, my nephew. So there's two wheels, so we would, I mean, this isn't part of the kids' clay class, but it gives you the idea of it. So for 15 years, I did a kids' clay class, which was absolutely involving the community, and people were involved. I had an exhibition at the end. We had all the parents come, made brownies, and you name it. Um, after 15 years, we sort of couldn't really do that. We, I actually successed out of it. I didn't really have space anymore for all the kids' work and the time in the kilns because I kept getting more and more people and more successful. And I, I now, because I'm a softie, if some kid comes in and wants something, I just give them a ball of clay. So I go out on the bench outside and make something and I'll fire it up for you. But I'm not doing classes, per se. And it gave the co-potters an opportunity to teach and make money, too. Sorry, getting dry. Okay, so talking about community involvement, um, we, well, I don't know, 10, 15 I don't know, years ago, we started doing picking an animal and doing a theme, and then everybody in the community could make something related to the animal. Originally it was clay, but then we expanded to anything. And it would be a silent auction, and it would fundraise for something in the community, a new fire truck, a pumper fire truck, the library, the neighborhood house, but works, you know, the uh, children's programs. Um, this theme was pig, so this is a group of work of bring, do pig. So everybody, this is a group of everybody's work. We invite children, so you can see there's, we put it out <coughs> on one day in August, we make a posters, make a big deal. And we put down a little sheet that you just, who made it, and write down your name and how much you'll pay. And then at the end, really simple, we, whoever wins at whatever time it ends would come down to the shop and buy it and take the piece. And it was really fun for the community, so every two years, any age, any material. <coughs> One guy made pigs in a blanket and walked around hand, you know, handing them off as a food. Um, people were so freaking creative. Um, they got okay. That's kind of what it looked like on the dock, just to give you, like, we spread them all out and make signs. That's kind of a lot of work for us, the people who worked at the shop. But it was always a good payback for the community. Pig aprons. That's one of my favorite <coughs> workers at the shop. Um, this artist, Ashley Bryan, was a kind of well-known artist on the island for many years. So we'd give him blanks. I'd, I'd make blanks. I'd make like ceramic big plate of platters, hand him some black stain, and he would paint it. So he painted this for Blackbird, Raven, Crow was that theme. It was a black bird. And it was raising money for the Ashley Bryan Center for uh, something they were building in his honor. And then I would glaze it. So after he painted it, I would just put a clear glaze. And I did it with anybody who wanted to do that. So there other people would paint platters if they couldn't make pots. So there's just, this is just, you know, oh, so we had fun with the community. So just, we'd invite people in, a lot of ad hoc, like, hey, come on in and make something, even though it wasn't really classes. That was fun, huh? Look at that. Okay, then I finally, when I reached 30 years, I had a um, party. So we had live music, oh my gosh, food. Caitlin's lit. Um, I, in the back, I hung up pictures of the former potters. In the back there, there's little pictures of every former potter. It was supposed to be every two years, but I broke my rules once in a while. Like, I'd let some potters stay longer <laughs> if I really liked them. <laughs> or, you know, if they lived on the island. Okay, so here's food, here's the community. Islesburg has a ton of regulars. Like, probably Camden, you have a lot of regular people that come in and begin to know you. So you can really cultivate that. And they come in every summer, some are year-rounders. The lobstermen and their families were great customers, the summer people. 
or totally awesome. Look at this. Oh my god, it is right. So I gave away tumblers. So this party, I made tumblers for a, a, a party favor. So I made a lot of millions, like two, I think 250 tumblers went out. I put them all on the, on the shelf. Is it there? Where's the? There it is. On the left, you see the shelf with all these tumblers. I just filled it up with tumblers. I pick a tumbler and come and get your punch. And thank you for all your business at my shop and all you've spent here. And come and visit me and yacked it up. So it was really fun. And um, that's my husband, my husband and his friend. And then live music. Oh my gosh, it was so much fun. That was one of my favorite days on the planet in the uh, in the shop. And so many people came. And then this is my high tech, you know, sign for the <laughs> summer. You know, when, this is what I would put out in every August. That's the end. Aww. Just before, one more second, just to make sure I did, I covered my notes. So, <coughs> if I was going to give advice, so in, it's, I'll make this real quick because I think I'm in good time. Um, You're good. You have a few low tech, you know, keep it keep it simple. Community building is awesome. Have some parties and make it friendly. Like come in and say, hey, wait, will you watch my store a minute? I got to go down to the ladies' room. People are like, oh, okay, cool. Like, just like, it's so much fun to just in, include people in their their world to your world, and it, it doesn't. And they watch you work, um, but you have sometimes you have to work in the mornings if you can concentrate during the busy times. But it's busy and it's not busy. And it's great. So I'm very very blessed. All right. Come here, Andy. Thank you. Yeah. I don't know if I can follow this. I mean, you guys are amazing. And all I'm going to talk about is like how co-ops build community. And that's why they're a good alternative model. But here you are doing that in your model, right? So um, co-ops are great, um, but they might not be, you know, the best for you. Um, they're an option. Yes, could you toss them yeah, up, please? So that has uh, the just a general overview of the co-op structure on it. Um, all right, so my name is Emmy Anderson. Thank you for the introduction earlier. I'm not going to spend any time on that. Uh, artwork throughout this uh, slideshow is done by my youngest daughter, Dagny, um, for your enjoyment. Um, so a cooperative is a business that's not only focused on profit, it's what my point is here, but neither are your businesses great. Um, but it also prioritizes community, democracy in the workplace and in, in the membership, and shared ownership as well as financial stability. Uh, so why is it better? It, it might not be, you know? It, it, it actually might not be. You know, form follows function, right? So if you have an idea and you have a great business partner to um, explore that idea with, then you um, and then you can contact the resources that you need, just like um, both of you guys have done, uh, and you and you find a model that works for you. Then that's the model that works for you. Um, so a co-op is an alternative. It's not might not be the best solution, but it could be, and um, it could be because cooperatives are based on the values of self-help, self-responsibility, democracy, equality, equity, and solidarity. Uh, which are great. It builds this strength in, in the organization, right, from, from the inside out. Um, and to put those values into practice, co-ops around the world have agreed on seven cooperative principles. One is voluntary open membership, which means that um, if you're able to and willing to agree to the membership agreements of the cooperative, you can join. Um, Number two is democratic member control, which means uh, if you're a member, you have one vote. You cannot buy yourself more votes. So you have equal power amongst the membership. Um, three is member economic participation. You are most certainly going to put some equity into the cooperative, some monies into the cooperative. But you also have control over how that um, capital is managed. Um, Principle four is autonomy and independence, which means that as a co-op, you don't go into, um, you don't 
uh, enter into contracts with other organizations that will uh, jeopardize your democratic member control. So an outside agency uh, funder, for example, can't come in and dictate um, what, uh, who makes decisions in the organization. Uh, and five is education, training, and information. Uh, internally, co-ops, uh, by its structure, uh, develops a, um, a strong educational program for their uh, workers or members. Um, um, and they also train uh, and inform the public about what cooperatives mean and the greater movement of cooperatives. Uh, principle six is cooperation among cooperatives. It's, um, it just means that cooperatives come together for um, greater impact, this sort of an economy of scales idea, where um, you bring information to the community, um, you, by uh, working together with other cooperatives, you strengthen that cooperative, and you can uh, develop and, um, and spread information about cooperatives and improve the, um, the cooperative economy. Uh, number seven is concern for community, and again, <laughs> This is what your presentations were about. You're, you're concerned with your community and, um, and that gives back to your business and it's the same idea here. You live uh, and work in an area and your ownership, your membership is, um, you know, need, to, need to take care of that environment, that community, in order for the business to actually be able to function, right? Because if you, for example, have an, uh, an organization that pollutes the environment in your in your area, then you can't work there or, or live there with your children, for example. So that's the idea of uh, concern for community. And we saw that in your businesses, um, which, um, you know, it excites me that people, individuals, take that step and actually does good for the community. Um, this, again, structure is built to uh, enhance that. Because um, in your businesses, great, but Maybe around the corner, Joe is not doing the same thing. He's just, you know, raking up the, raking in the profits, you know, marking products up um, at an un unreasonable rate. So, um, uh, all for his own benefit. Uh, okay, moving on. Oops. Um, so, what type of cooperatives are there? There are worker owned cooperatives, there are consumer owned cooperatives producer owned cooperatives. Um, businesses can also be owners of cooperatives. Uh, and we have multi-stakeholder owned cooperatives. Um, for the most part, and in this setting, as we talk about direct to consumer, um, artist co-ops, uh, in my opinion, mm -hmm. would fall under producer owned cooperatives. Uh, they can also be worker owned, um, maybe even consumer owned or business owned. Um, depending on what you, the goal uh, for your business is or, or, or the need that you're meeting. Uh, what all of them have in common uh, is that they are user-owned, they're user-controlled, and user-benefited. So why would you start a cooperative? Um, there are a lot of benefits to it. Um, there's improving, improved bargaining power, uh, you know, the strength in numbers. You can reduce costs because you share equipment. Uh, you have access to markets and products and services that you wouldn't have unnecessarily if you were selling out of your own studio, perhaps. Um, but the biggest thing that I think here is, is the shared decision-making power. So you have the power as a, a member of a cooperative to make decisions in a shared environment and, um, and work towards the common goal. It really empowers people um, and it creates a sense of democracy in, in your workplace, in your life, in your community. Uh, so for artist co-ops, um, some of the benefits are uh, like I said before, marketing, selling products, you know, getting together to be able to get your products out there. So if you have an idea and if you are, um, you know, forming a group that want to, to sell your products, you have a, a similar interest or similar um, art focus, um, you can reach a wider market um, by, by banding together. Uh, you have perhaps more independence and control from, you know, 
um, selling in an art gallery uh, that's already established, you have some rules set, right? So you might be a little discriminatory when it comes to what art you want to bring in. Here, you have control over that, and you also have control over uh, the fees that you set, the, the commission fees, for example, uh, on, on your work, um, things like that. Uh, and you can share equipment. So if you have a studi studio slash art gallery space, and you have two pottery wheels, then um, and you have, you know, say you have ten members of the cooperative, you can you can share that equipment, and and each individual potter does not have to go and invest in a kiln and a and a wheel and all and the glazes and all of this stuff. You do that together. You pool your resources, um, um, and and of course, when you're in in a space that is accessible to your customers. Uh, it increases your earning potential as well. Uh, technical and business assistance, like I said before with the principle five, uh, education and training is built into the model. So uh, naturally you have um, some of that coming out of the cooperative uh, at a shared cost. And, um, and you also pool resources and skills, right? You come together with different skills uh, like QuickBooks and, <laughs> and selling art or, or producing art. Um, and you, um, um, you, you can find uh, power in that and, um, and share and learn um, those pieces together. Uh, some of the considerations to, to think about is that in a cooperative you might have to um, invest some money as a member uh, and uh, together as a group the cooperative uh, decides what that looks like. Um, the commission fees, as in any other gallery, but here you have that decision-making power. And um, you know, before you form the cooperative, in that process of developing it, it's important to um, spell out those things very clearly. Um, you might have annual dues as part of the membership. Staff vo versus volunteer time. Again, having someone that is hired from the beginning can be a real um, can can really set you up for success versus. Uh, you know, having member burnout, for example, because y you, you're all volunteering your time and you can't make it work with your personal schedule. Having a dedicated staff member or two could solve that. So those are things in quality control. Do you have a quality control committee, for example, that, um, that looks at the work and, and what does that look like? So those are some of the art-specific um, considerations that co-ops would need to figure out uh, before forming. Uh, the general, or actually one thing I wanted to mention about the technical business assistant, uh, assistance piece was um, I reached out to a few artist cooperatives here in Maine before I came here because I wanted to know what their structure looked like and and what we can learn from them. And the uh, Pemaquid, sorry for the pronunciation of that, but I think that's how you pronounce it, Pemaquid Craft Cooperative. Uh, their uh, bylaws, their operating agreements state that they, are, they exist to train and educate the members in the proper organization and, con and, conduct, and conduct of small self-employed business venture. So they're sort of an incubator. They, they are there to really support the artist to understand what it means to sell, to produce and sell their products. And so they're teaching them um, at the same time. Right, sorry for that side note. Going back to general structure. Um, so like I said before, the producer-owned co-op structure I think is the one that fits this, um, a, an artist co-op, and when we're talking about direct-to-consumer. To um, however, in the state of Maine, uh, you can't incorporate as a producer co-op if you're an artist co-op. Uh, you can only do so if you're an agricultural producer. So there are some options here. Um, artists can, artist co-ops can form LLCs, nonprofits, or corporations, either S corporations or C corporations, and those entities can then elect to have a co-op governing structure, which means they um, their operating agreements reflect um, how a, a co-op operates, and that makes you a co-op not necessarily your incorporation size. I know this is like a little boring and technical, <laughs> but 
Um, but I, I recently also made a connection with an attorney um, that knows a little bit more about law than I do. And uh, response from this lawyer is, I agree that a producer co-op in Maine is limited to agricultural products. Consumer cooperatives also does not seem like a great fit here. The artist cooperative could instead be formed using the entity structures, uh, other entity structures such as a corporation, LLC, or nonprofit. LLCs probably provide the most flexibility and simplicity. Uh, Maine also does restrict the use of the cooperative or co-op in the name of the. Um, if not formed under a specific co-op statute. So that's also important to remember. Um, and I've seen co-ops that are not incorporated as co-ops use the co-op in their name. Uh, how, I don't know who pleases that. Honestly, I don't think anyone does. But those are things to consider as you're thinking about forming cooperatives. So the steps, Five steps, general steps um, to forming a cooperative, and some people will tell you that these are, you know, these these might be manipulated in different ways. But in general, these are the steps that you want to follow. You want to identify the need and organize around it. You need to find the people uh, that want to do this with you. Like, do you have someone that is really excited about, you know, they're getting to the point where they need to sell their art. They want to get together with you to, to talk about this. Form that group. Um, uh, outline your goals. Uh, you have to invest time and energy and probably money into, you know, exploring what that idea looks like. Uh, and then f you have to form a leadership structure of that group, otherwise it's going to fall apart. Even uh, dedicate, uh, designate leadership, uh, and then cultivate a shared vision. <coughs> uh, super important. Take the time uh, with this step. Then conduct feasibility study. You have to do the research, um, <laughs> market studies, financials. Reach out to anyone that you can find that is a resource for you. Um, just like Colin was talking about, uh, call call the gallery that you have a connection to and ask. Maybe call Colin. <laughs> hey, can you share some financials? Co-ops in general share information widely, but um, private businesses might not want to do that. But you can ask, always ask. Um, build your business plan. After you have all that research done, build your business plan. Uh, that's the document that's going to guide you forward as a group. And it's also going to be the document that you want to bring to a funder to get money. Um, turn your idea into a creation. You got to draft the bylaws, the operating agreements, and incorporate the cooperative. Hold the first meeting approve the bylaws, and elect the board of directors. I am sorry if this is boring. <laughs> okay. um, but these are really important steps. And even if you're not forming a cooperative, these are business steps that you need to take. Um, if you are, um, so once you've done, uh, once you have elected a board of directors you and incorporated, you are a co-op, and at that point, you need to have your first board meeting to elect officers of the cooperative. After that, you can acquire, acquire capital using your business plan. Talk to anyone and everyone who you might think can be of help to do that. Uh, don't be shy to ask for money, just do it. Uh, you need that money to buy equipment and space and hire people <laughs> so that you don't burn out. Uh, it's a really uh, big piece, like one of the downfalls or pitfalls of any business is to not have proper um, <laughs> um, proper management of staff in place before you start. Um, so prepare for opening and then you're not done. You have to make sure that you manage your business moving forward. The first few years are the most critical. You need to have your finger on the pulse. So. To be successful, proper capitalization, you've got to find that cash to support the business. Um, install systematic accounting systems, even if they're on paper, right? you know exactly what you need to do to keep track of your monies. Um, that's really important. Uh, properly organize human and financial resources. Be clear on what everyone's job is, have policies and procedures in place. Um, prepare regular financial reports and develop 
budgets, yearly budgets, long-term budgets, um, and, and yes, clarity and simplicity. Like Co-ops can seem super complex, and they are because people are involved, more than one or two people, usually, and that makes it complex. So try to make everything as simple as possible. Um, all your policies, procedures, make it clear. Um, the key with cooperatives are, is strong member engagement. Um, it's really important to build that in from the start, and it takes time. Every, you know, creating buy-in and ownership, um, allowing people to, to be part of, understanding the financial statements, um, understanding the business flows, like all of those pieces are really important and it brings solidarity into the picture, it brings more democracy into the picture, um, and creates a more successful co-op. Right, so ask for money and ask for help. Like there are so many resources out there. At Island Institute is one which I didn't put up here, sorry. Uh -huh. But there is there are cooperative experts now at CEI, Genesis Community Loan Fund is a place where you can get money. Bernstein sure has recently put a team of co-op experts in place. We haven't had co-op attorneys in the state of Maine until last year. This is it. So the community is growing, the cooperative movement is growing, and the support for cooperatives are there. Um, you know, if, does this guy look scary? <laughs> Chris Linder, he is one of the loan officers in Maine for Cooperative Fund of New England, or CFME. Um, or actually, the Cooperative Fund of the Northeast now. They've changed the name, sorry. Um, I think Joel Eclumenate. Omar Hassan at Cooperative Development. Cooperative Development Institute does a lot of free services um, for low income or um, certain communities. And uh, they have five uh, cooperative developers in the state. Uh, cooperative Fund in England, I think, has three people working in the state. I'm with the Cooperative Main Business Alliance, and I can connect you to resources. And you know me now, so it's easy to, for you to just talk to me. But, but don't be afraid to go to these resources. They're just humans. They're just like you and I, and they make mistakes, and they're uh, fun, and some do art, and you know, they, just grab them. Um, I think this is my biggest point. Like, regardless of if you're starting a cooperative, a sole proprietorship, you just want to open a seasonal little studio slash gallery space in the back of your barn or, or whatever, just ask people for help. I am really bad at that. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to you know, give a shout out for the cooperative economy in Maine. It's growing. It's uh, um, with all the support that I just showed you. It just support systems there. Uh, we have a bill uh, coming through the taxation committee right now. Uh, it's called LD 1267 and it has a longer name that's on a piece of paper up here that I can give you, but it, um, it incentivizes sales of businesses to cooperative groups. And it also um, is slated to build a uh, employee ownership center in Maine, which is like a small business uh, development center uh, for cooperatives. So uh, again, another resource, right, to, to build these structures. Um, okay, am I on time? Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so this is your time to ask your burning questions. Um, and um, generally, I could over-facilitate this and call on each of you, but I feel like I'm confident in these people to call on you. Um, so. If you have questions, ask them. If not, um, I've got like tons of questions, but I would much rather hear from the rest of you. So. Does anyone have a question? I've got a question. <laughs> I guess for the two of you, really, in, in your community, is what kind of initiatives do you think were have been the most effective in getting the real, true, local Mainer community? The lobstermen, people on the other side of Route 1 in Camden, um, those people to engage and, and come come out and actually look at what you're doing. Step into the gallery. Do you go 
go ahead first. All right. Uh, I think for us, it's the kids' show primarily. Like that's been um, the it's both being lucky enough to be next to an ice cream shop and having the kids' show because um, the kids' show brings in well, actually that and there's a show we do for the food pantry. Um, we I, another thing I forgot to mention we do several shows a year where we donate a percentage of sales to a nonprofit. So if we have a show that's about an animal theme, we'll give 10% of sales that month to the local humane society. Um, and then people hear about those things from part of the humane society world and come in. Um, and so the kids show just brings in families who would normally never walk into a gallery. And it's, really, it's one of the big benefits of it is that people who don't think this is their world come in and, and enjoy what they see and talk to us. And, Kind of their jaws drop some of our prices. <laughs> we laugh about it, so, but like that's nice. Um, and then the the, um, the AIO food pantry fundraiser, as we have twenty to thirty artists paint on paint. <coughs> so I don't mean to say paint every time to um, sculptors and photographers and other types of artists, but make a piece of art out of a bowl, and then we auction them off at the end of the of two weeks of showing them for the food pantry. And that brings in people who are supporters or participants in the food pantry or heating assistant programs. And it's the same thing. It's just really rewarding that they come in and realize that they are welcome in our space. Nice. Yeah, I would just add that, because we also do that like show where the lobstermen who live on the island, their kids were often part of it. But interestingly, right next door to our dock is the lobstermen's co-op dock. Mm -hmm. So I have a very good relationship with the lobster on the island because partly when they close at four o'clock, I sell lobsters for them. Because I have a store that's open until six and I have bags, money, change, credit card, and I'm there. So they don't go there, they have a little sign that says go over to the shop or maybe it's more like word of mouth. So people come over at the end of the day if they need a lobster and I have a cage hanging off the dock at the end of the float. So I can haul it up and weigh out lobsters and the the co the lobster room for the co-op will keep it filled. Like I call them up, like I need 15 more for the weekend, okay? And they're closed on Sunday, so they want their money. And yeah. they give me, they give some to me for 50 cents of our boat price. So I make about 50 cents a, a sale. I'm just not about money. But it's, I don't make a lot of money. I make a little money. <coughs> but I get them for a discount when I have my guests. So that helps, I mean, if that's what you mean. But other than that, I'm not- Yeah, I mean, that's a proximity anything. thing. I mean, that's pr I mean, I'm just lucky because yeah. I'm on a little island and it's like 50 people year round and a lot of them are lobstermen. And then yeah. there's three to 400 in the summer, which are summer people. So I have a, you know, we're just luck. It's just luck to be on a community where they already support it because it's something for their kids to do and sell their lobsters. So they, they, part they participate a lot in the activities there, I think most of them. Interesting, because friendship, there's a huge lobstering community. We have wonderful community engagement with them, but to get them to step foot in the gallery is a whole other thing. Even if it is for, the, you know, we always, my mo mother always, you know, contributes 30% of one of the shows to the food pantry or something like that which is great and they love that, but they'd be happier to hand you a check in the store to say put this to the food pantry than they would be to actually, it's still not for them. I, th I think it's hard to engage with some, I mean, the, um, like the, the things we're selling are of such a high price yeah. that I think some of the audience you're talking about, they, they don't, when we engage with them it's to try to give back and include people, but it's, they're not, we're not necessarily marketing them to try to sell. So it is it's sort of, yeah, it's a tricky one. Yeah, I would just add, I mean, this is for not just lobster room, but any human. I mean, one thing I find successful in my store, if you have a store, and I'm not sure you can do this or not with paintings, but I have a huge price range. I mean, I have from the seconds, and I have small items, and I have things that are that cost, I mean, ceramics and pottery don't cost as much as paintings normally. Anyway, so, and they're useful, so they can, like, they'll definitely come in because there's a range. And anybody, you more, I feel like more sales happen to anybody if there's a range of prices. And I do have a few really high-end pieces, too, because there are those people that come in that are like, they don't even care what anything costs. They'll say, I'll take all three of those, and I'll be back in a minute. 
So they, you know, all of it. But the price range is really good, I think, to have that feel not, you know, like, oh, this is for a whole other group of people. Yeah. I don't know how you could do that. But the painting gallery is trickier, but you said you have other stuff. We have, right? Yeah, we do. We have some um, prints, uh, yeah. we have etchings and things, and some, uh, there's, yeah, there's lower price paintings. You don't, there's, have there's a you don't have seconds in paintings, no. do you? <laughs> I always line some up for my mother at the dump. Yeah. <laughs> she says, get rid of this. Yeah. <laughs> see what you can make. It. Yeah. <laughs> see if the guys will put it in the office there. It's a good, good question there. Anyone else? I mean, the only stuff I would add, because I forgot to probably say it, is is, is like one nice thing is if you, when you talked about help and you hire help. So yes, I had a co-potter come in who was often a former student, not always, and they would work, but I didn't pay them. Okay, here's what it was, it was a trade. It was a win-win. They got free space. I didn't charge them for studio space, but they got to use it as studio space. I made sure they was shared. I made sure they had some room and hoped they would have enough room. We worked out a trade of who works which hours Sometimes we could, we'd overlap and work the same hours, and sometimes we didn't, so I depended on that so I could be gone. They got 90% of their sales. I got 10% for the kill firings and the credit card fees, or whatever you wanted, I got too. So I got a tiny percentage, but they, they felt like a win-win because they could make money on their work, with, and keep, the only thing they had to buy themselves was their clay and their glazes. They had bring them that, they had to bring. I didn't charge them for the space itself, just time to work. So it was kind of a win-win in that way. And um, and when I sell other people's work, this is another huge successful thing. I'm sure you already know this. I sell other people's work that aren't involved at the shop, but I get a percentage of those sales. So in the end, it it really helps to have that percentage. Uh, and I earn it by schlepping it out there on a boat and getting it onto the dock. Even if you're not schlepping it out on a boat, you still earn it. I do. Really, I no longer bring yes. to anyone, any galleries yeah. there. <laughs> no, and we promote their work and we, yeah, it's a lot of work. we do a lot and I really sell it. And I and also because, like any, you need a variety. You said some paintings are not your favorites. Well, everybody has a different opinion about a pot. A mug is like somebody's favorite mug is somebody else's least favorite. So you need, a, if you have a variety of styles, colors, shapes in your store or whatever it is, there's more likelihood that somebody will click with one of them or two of them, if not all of them. I mean, you know, if, if they don't like my work, they might like somebody else's, and then that you have more sales. So money is important, um, but that having variety, price range, different work, and and then and community involvement and something fun going on helps sales. It's all giving is receiving, so donations and doing all that. So let's just add. Can I add something to that? Oh, do we? Yeah, okay. I, I mean, Marion has comfy chairs. I mean, so people, it, it feels, your place is the hub of the community there. So it's very welcoming. People come and they sit in this, you know, this really old antique chair or, you know, you, you have, you have three chairs usually that are available. People come and they just sit and they hang out and they talk and they talk to the customers and it's just the social thing happening all day long. So it's, it's a hangout place. So you, you, you can you create a very welcoming place for people to come. Yes. Thank you. Yes, she's very spot. Yeah, certain times of the day. JC. Yeah, I uh, have a question for Colin and Mary. Did you both uh, do what Emmy was suggesting in terms of the um, planning work? You know, the, the business plan, the uh, answering the questions or, or points that she mentioned. And then the other thing is, both in, uh, impressed me with uh, talking about location without saying location, except for being next to the ice cream store. And I know where your shop is on the dock, it happens to be on the way to the restaurant, which is a cool and there's spot. some bathrooms on the And side. the bathroom, yes, yeah, between the bathrooms and the restaurant. That's a great what? Spot. <laughs> 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 it's a small island, so you're stuck there, and there aren't any other, well, there are other bathrooms, but not quite as successful. Anyway, 
So I'm just curious about the, the thought that went into where you are and where you are, and um, if it coincides with um, what Emmy was talking about, if that's looking back, is that something you would recommend as well, strongly? Well, I will go quickly because I really didn't do a lot of planning. I got the opportunity, cleaned it up, and I put my pots out with prices, and I had receipt pads, and, in, and I got credit cards. And I said, this is my business plan. I will bring pots. When somebody comes in, I'll say, hi, do you, let me know if you have any questions. Oh, you like something? Wash my hands and go make a sale. So I, I did not, but I eventually did in a slow, progressive way. Mine was not so much like sitting there and thinking, oh, I'll, do, I'll plan this stuff out for the future. It was more as it came. Then I got pregnant. I'm like, oh, I can't be in the shop every day. I think I'll have a co-potter. And they can have their own work. And they can work in the space. And I don't have to pay them because they can get space. So it keeps my cost low. And they get to learn something. And then more work. More and more work sold more. So it, those things developed more uh, in, in a, a natural, progressive way for me. But I would recommend it. I was always just pure lucky that I'm in a place where there's not a lot of competition. If somebody needs a good gift, there's a gift shop, there's me, and there's a bunch of painting galleries. So those are the choices. You know, there's not like, I'm really lucky. Um, so I did a fair, despite my jokes about not knowing anything about numbers, I did uh, crunch some numbers and uh, do a little bit of planning beforehand. Um, <clears throat> I made the calls to the other galleries. I was, we were trying to figure out location. Um, I wanted to be in Camden because it's where I live, even though Rockland, just down the road, has a lot of galleries. I wanted to be part of the community that I actually live in. Um, so finding, there is sort of what was available for retail space. I was very glad, my location's on Bayview Street, so it's not on the main Route 1. It's, like, it's great, so we don't get the just constant foot tra traffic of people who are just coming in because they're bored. It's sort of, um, it, it ends up being, it's right within the walking area of downtown, but just off of the main road. Um, I think our location is actually ideal, um, but that's partly due to the limits of what was available. And uh, I was trying to figure out rent, insurance, what the payroll was going to be, um, and <clears throat> all the you know opening costs, uh, like opening reception costs, sending out postcard mailers. It it is more. It turned in after the first year going back. I. I look less often than I used to. In the beginning, I was probably looking every two or three weeks at our PML, and <laughs> I was told to relax. Um, <laughs> and like, give it some time to actually build up some history, but I wanted to know where our costs meeting what I thought they were gonna be. I don't remember what my estimate was back then, but it, whatever it was, it ended up being just a hair over that. But it was fine, because our income was high, was more over what I expected the income to be. And I was basically basing my income estimates on, I had been selling art in Maine for like, 16 years probably, I'm making a living as an artist. So over the past 10 years or so, I had a set amount of money I tended to make per year. You never know when the year, it's still terrifying, and every year there's a month or two I think, holy shit, I don't, I need to get a job. Um, <laughs> but it was, I knew I, I could make X amount selling in other galleries. So if the gallery took 50% of all my sales alone, that should cover gallery costs, and then the 50% I've always gotten from my art sales would cover my living expenses, and then I, you know, I would see if we sold other people's work, then it would be, we'd be making profit on top of that. Um, so that was like my, I, I didn't, I, I was lucky not to need funding, so I didn't have to go into fund, like put together a real business plan, but I did very much have an idea of what I wanted this to look like. And actually, in terms of selling other people's work, when I felt like we were really successful is when we started selling other people's work. Because Kirsten and I both knew we could sell my paintings because she'd done it at the previous gallery and I'd been making a living doing it. But I had no idea how it would go selling other people's work. So that was when I felt like we really were successful. Well, we should probably wrap up if uh, there aren't any like urgent questions. Um, just have one more fast-forward question. Yeah. Um, what is who's, who's going to open a store? Anybody here? Yeah. <laughs> And that's all. <laughs> 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 I'm just interested in who attended. Who's going to do that now that Eric, you know, helpful? Does anyone have a store or a gallery at this point? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Well, part of it. <laughs> yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And no plans to open one? Just like getting. Definitely thinking about something. 
I just talk to any of us, I'm sure, later. Find us for him. I mean, if you have really any more questions. Yeah, and even if you're not going to open a cooperative, I'm willing to send you in directions uh, that you might need to go for resources. So. Yeah. Reach out. Thanks. That's great. I should probably introduce myself. I'm Alex Zapara. I work for Island Institute. I do a lot of business support economic development. So you can find me on our website. I don't have any cards. I just drive people to our website, our staff page. I wait the bottom. <laughs> but, huge thanks to our guests. This was incredible. Yeah. I couldn't have asked for anything better. Thank you.